this lecture, we're going to talk about block allocation schemes. Now, what we're talking about here are different ways where we can put a file system together. Now, when we talked about the MinX3, we talked about an index scheme where we had seven direct pointers, a singly indirect pointer, a doubly indirect pointer, and then a triply indirect pointer. So that's one way where we can allocate blocks. So if we want a block, we just find an empty pointer and point it to the block. And so that's one way we can do an empty belt or some sort of block allocation scheme. So the ones we're going to cover today are, we're going to start with the contiguous block allocation. So if you look at the lecture notes, you have the contiguous block allocation, you have the linked allocation, you have the clustered allocation, the file allocation table, and then finally the indexed allocation scheme. So if you recall back to the Minix3 file system, it uses the index allocation scheme. But we're going to cover that last just so that we can sort of tie that up with the Minix3 file system. So the one we're looking at now is the contiguous block allocation. In here, what we do is whenever we allocate certain number of blocks, and remember, the number of blocks is a function of the size of the file. So if the size of the file is, we divide the size by the block size, and plus one, we always have to have at least one block, and that's the number of blocks we're going to have associated with the file. However, in the contiguous block allocation, we are required to have one block follow the other physically on the disk. And so we've seen this before in something like C++'s vector, something like that, where whenever we need to allocate more elements of the vector, what we have to do is we have to copy it, allocate new memory, copy all the old into the new, and then delete the old. So in a contiguous block allocation scheme, we still have something like an inode. More generically, we can call it FCB, file control block, but essentially it's the inode. Okay, this tells you where to go to find the blocks, that sort of stuff. And essentially points to a block. Okay, now how we know how many blocks this is, is the FCB has a size field, just like the inode, it has a size field. And so what we can do is we can just divide the size field, take the pointer, we now know where the first block is. We don't need to know where the other blocks are because they're contiguous with the first block. They follow the first block. And then we know when we get to the last block, whenever we exhausted the size of the file. And so this is the contiguous block allocation. Now, one thing about this is usually we allocate in blocks because files can grow and they can also shrink. So what happens whenever I overwrite a file and make it something completely different? Well, I have to find a, a allocation, a contiguous allocation, big enough to store my files. Now, this isn't a problem if we have an empty disk, but as the disk gets more fragmented and the disk gets more full, the chances are we're not gonna find an, a block allocation with all that we need. So if we look at a disk, let's just say this is just a zoomed out view of the disk. We have all these blocks everywhere. And let's say we need three blocks. So this is block index zero, one, two, three, four, and then five, okay? Well, if these are being taken up, so say this is being taken up by file, well, we'll just call it my.txt, okay? And we need three blocks. So this block is now being taken up. Well, what happens now? Well, because the disk is almost full, because we're using three, so it's essentially 50% full here, because we're using block zero and one for my.txt, we're using block three for another file. So the only ones we have available to us are block two, block four, and block five. However, our next file needs three blocks and they have to be contiguous. However, with this disk, there is no way to do it unless we move block three up to block two and just essentially swap those two, then we can use it. So if you're very familiar with Windows where you had disk defragmenter, that's essentially what it's trying to do. Now, one thing about the disk defragmenter is it's not necessarily for a contiguous block allocation because the file system that it used was not contiguous but essentially you're doing the same thing. You're trying to move all the used blocks together. So, and it's mainly to reduce seek times. Now, what are the advantages of using a contiguous block allocation? Why would we ever use something like this? Well, number one, we don't have to store a lot of information, do we? So all we have to do is know where the index of the very first block is. As soon as we know where the first block is, we just take the size and we know where all the subsequent blocks are. It's also very fast. We don't have to seek because everything is in line with each other. So we can actually merge the full request. Remember seeking in, or uh, sorting and merging. We don't have to sort the request. We can merge the request into one big read to read all of the blocks of the file or whatever we need in there. And so that is the advantage of it. It's very fast. It's very good for long-term storage. 
So if I'm going to store a file but not manipulate it, read from it, write to it, that sort of stuff. I'm sorry, not read from. That's what you want to do. But if we're just reading from a file and we're not writing to it all the time, the contiguous block allocation makes sense. And this is used a lot in like SQL database servers, that sort of stuff. They'll use a contiguous block allocation, especially with something that doesn't move very often. So the next thing we have, so you see that we have a lot of disadvantages, especially as the disk gets full. It's very hard to, to get blocks to line up like that. And so we have a linked allocation that sort of solves that problem. So let's take a look at what the linked allocation is going to do. So in this diagram, we still have the FCB, the I node, and it basically tells you here's the first block. However, we don't know where the next blocks are because it's not a contiguous block allocation. So they might not fall in line. So in this case, we have a pointer to the next block. At the very end of the first block, we have a pointer to the next block. At the very end of that block, we have another pointer. And essentially, at the end of each block, we have a pointer to the next block. So going back to our original example here, what we can do with 0, 1, 3 is we can allocate our next file. So remember, our file needed three blocks. So we can allocate two, and at the end of two, it points to four. So we allocate four, and then at the end of four, it points to five. So there you go. So we are able to use all the space available to us. We are using now block two, four, and five to store this file. Now, this sort of solves the contiguous block allocation. But as you can see, now whenever we do a read, we can't just read two, three, four, and five. Why? Because three belongs to somebody else. So we're going to have to read two, and then four, and five. And so merging that request is a little bit difficult because it's not in a contiguous block. So let's take a look at the other ways that we can do this. Well, first of all, let's cover the advantages of it. Number one, it sort of fixes what we talked about with the contiguous block allocation. However, with that flexibility comes disadvantages. Obviously, it's slower because now these blocks can essentially be anywhere inside the disk. Now, if this is a spinning media disk, obviously, seek times are a big deal when it's not contiguous. It can waste disk space because at the end of each block, we are required to store a pointer. So no matter what our, disk si or our file size is, we have to take the file size and add on whatever the pointer size is. And sometimes that's only four bytes. So for example, in the Minix 3, it's just four bytes. But it depends on the file system. And then finally, it decreases reliability. So if we have these blocks scattered everywhere, and a little part of our disk gets scratched, like on a CD or something like that, well, now we don't... We, we can get to the block, but now we're stuck there because if that pointer is damaged, there's no way to get to the other blocks. There could be five, six, seven, eight, or maybe even 10 blocks coming after that. And so we might not be able to get to those blocks. So it doesn't make it very reliable. Remember on a contiguous allocation scheme, if we destroy one of those blocks, we still can get to the other ones because we know where they are. In this case, we don't know where the next blocks are unless we have a pointer. And that's what the linked allocation is. So this mimics very closely the linked list. If you think of a linked list, you have a structure, we'll just call it LL. And in here you have data, and then you have a next pointer. So the next pointer is an LL, so to get to the next one, you have a head, LL head. So it's usually a pointer, and if I wanna to get to the next, I do head next, okay? And I can keep doing that, until we get a null pointer that tells us we're at the end of it. And that's essentially what this is doing. Until we reach the end of the block, which is going to be a null block, usually zero or something like that, well, we just keep on keeping on. We just keep trucking and divulging what the next block is. Now, sometimes we don't need a null pointer because we can sort of use what the CVA did. We can just use the size to know how many nexts we need to get through. And so those are the different ways we can do that. So once again, the linked allocation solves the problem where all the blocks don't need to be contiguously allocated next to each other. But it, with that flexibility, we obviously have some disadvantages. So let's talk about a middle ground between the, cluster, the contiguous block allocation and the linked allocation, which is called clustered allocation. Now in this case, we essentially have best of both worlds. Inside of here, what we're going to have is clusters of contiguous block arrays. So if we went back to our other example, what we would do is we'd have two is one cluster. It would have a, a pointer over to four, and then four and five would be grouped next to each other. 
However, this gives us a little bit of an issue. Number one, we have to know how many contiguous blocks we have because we have to know, all right, is there a next pointer coming? Because as you can see in this diagram on the lecture notes, we don't have a next pointer for the first block, the second block. We only have a next pointer for the last block. And so in this case, we have to have a uniform size of our contiguous block array. Now this can help because we can have a smaller cluster and that's why it's called cluster. We can have, so each one of these little blocks right here, these three blocks on top of each other is called a cluster. And we point to the next cluster by using the pointer at the bottom. So only one block in the whole cluster contains the next pointer. Everything else is contiguous. So as you can see, this sort of does both the linked allocation scheme as well as the, close, the contiguous block allocation scheme. So in this case, now we have smaller contiguous block arrays. So remember in the CBA, the entire file had to be contiguous. Well, in this case, the entire file no longer has to be contiguous. Only certain number of blocks have to be contiguous. And that is decided whenever you create the file system. Then we have something called the file allocation table. This is the old DOS system that they had. Essentially what you have is you have a allocation table and the allocation table is stored in a certain segment in the disk. And in this allocation table, you're going to have a bunch of indices and it's just basically going to say, here's the block that belongs to me. Here's another block that belongs to me, that sort of stuff. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So in this case, a file allocation table is essentially one big table. And it's almost like the bitmap in the Minix 3 file system where we have one entry per block. And so what we're going to have is inside of each entry, we have an index. So say like three, and then we have a next pointer, which tells us where in the table we need to go next. And so whenever we look at our inode, our file control block, it's going to point to the first allocation or first element inside of the allocation table. So notice these don't point to blocks. Unlike the linked allocation scheme where the actual next pointer is stored inside of a block itself, instead, this is stored in an allocation table. Number one, remember allocation table lookups is an O of one operation. In fact, many times we buffer this entire table into RAM. That way there, whenever we look at these, this tells me I need to go to block three. It points to over here, this says block four, so this says go over to allocation table one. This says go over to allocation table two. So as you can see, we have two different numbers in here. One of the numbers says, here's the block that belongs to me. The second number says, here's the next block that belongs to me. So in this case, because we have a next index, we don't have to store these as contiguous allocations. And so there you go. The file allocation table is developed whenever you create your file system. So it's a function of the size of the disk and the size of the block size. And so we can actually cache this and that sort of stuff. Now, the problem with it is if this is wrecked in any way, if this part of the disk is ever destroyed, you essentially lost all information related to where the blocks are located. It's also, it, do, it doesn't scale very well for like gigabytes and gigabytes and terabytes of disk space. This will not scale well because you're gonna have these entries everywhere. Remember, each one of these is required to have two separate integers to store the, the index of the block that I need to go to and then the next pointer of the next element inside the array that I need to go to. And so the file allocation table sort of went out of style because we have such large disks now. And so that led us into the indexed allocation scheme. This is the one that most file systems, Unix style file systems use. And an indexed allocation scheme, it's essentially what Minix 3 has. We have a direct zone, and in there, we have an index. It says, hey, this is the first block that belongs to me. And if you go to the next direct zone, this says, here's the next block that belongs to me. So if you remember with the Minix 3 file system, we had seven direct zones. So in the zone, all it is is essentially an index to a block. And what we do is we start at the top zone and we keep going and that orders the block for the file. That way there we don't have blocks out of order. So the direct zones come first, after that, we have what's called an indirect zone. So if you remember back in the Minix 3 file system, an indirect zone points to a block, but that block does not contain file system information. Instead of it, the whole block is just nothing but index pointers. And those plot point to the blocks that belong to the file. A doubly indirect zone is essentially the same style, except now we have a block 
that points to other blocks, and those blocks actually have the pointers to the file system blocks. So that's why I colored these in red and orange, because those don't actually contain any information at all of what's stored inside the file. Only these green blocks right here store what the file actually needs to contain. And so if we look at that, Minix 3 file system, it's not a very hard system, and we can allocate new blocks because we're only storing indices to a block. And because of that, we don't have to store a next pointer on each block. So if one block goes bad, it doesn't ruin the entire file system. Now, the only problem with this is we have a fixed size number of pointers. So if you think back to the Minix 3 file system, we had seven direct pointers, one indirect pointer, one doubly indirect pointer, and one triply indirect pointer. And so that gives us around about 17 gigabytes per file. But if my file needs to exceed 17 gigabytes, I would have to allocate another inode for it. It's not possible for one inode to, to address more than 17 gigabytes of file data or whatever it needs to be. And so that's what we have. So just to recap, we have the contiguous block allocation scheme in which the blocks actually follow each other. The advantages of those is, hey, we can merge the request, make one read, and we've read the entire file because they're not scattered everywhere over the disk. So we don't need to seek around the disk to find it. Now with the advent of solid state drives, we really don't care because solid state drives are more of a randomized access. And so we can scatter around the disk and all that sort of stuff. Now we generally use this whenever we need to merge one request, but whenever we're doing a lot of reads with very, very minimal writes. Because remember, as soon as we write to a contiguous block allocation, if we ever need to allocate a new block, we have to make sure that we have a contiguous block. So in this little picture that I'm showing you now, we only have four blocks. If I needed to add a fifth, it needs to be contiguous. It means it needs to follow the fourth block down here. If it doesn't, what we have to do is we have to copy, we have to allocate five blocks, copy these four into the upper four of those five blocks, and then we would have our fifth block, and then we would delete all these blocks. Now, being able to find that many free blocks contiguous is very difficult to do, especially as the disk gets full. That's why this isn't used very often. Remember the linked allocation. Essentially what we have is the first block is pointed to by the inode. After that, each block at the end of each block is a pointer to the next block. And so each block is required to store a pointer. And so we have to incur an overhead of the size of the pointer for each block. So if our block size is relatively small, say 1,024 bytes or something like that, then we will actually incur quite a bit. So just think of that as percentage wise, as we incur an overhead for each additional pointer that we need to store in there. As the block size gets sufficiently large, say like 65,000 bytes or something like that, then the pointer at four bytes or eight bytes, whatever it happens to be, doesn't really, it's not a, a large percentage of the block size. However, remember the linked allocation now blocks can be anywhere because now we have a pointer that says, hey, go to this block, go to that block. So that's what fixes the continuous block allocation. However, we obviously have, it's slower because we have to seek more often. Well, so a clustered allocation is sort of that middle ground. In the clustered allocation, we still have these clusters, but they're much smaller. And at the end of each cluster, we have a pointer like the linked allocation that says, here's where you find the next cluster of contiguous blocks. So in here, it's almost like the contiguous block array. So if this was a contiguous block array uh, allocation scheme, we'd have all nine of these blocks stacked on top of each other. Well, that would be very difficult to find nine blocks stacked on top of each other. So what we can do is we can cut these in clusters of three blocks, which is much more likely to occur naturally. And then at the last block, the block number three, we have a pointer that says, here's where you can find the next cluster. If you recall with the file allocation table, we generally look at the allocation table to see where all the things of a file are. That's why we can store the allocation table in memory, and we know exactly all of the blocks that, that are belonging to a certain file. And inside the file allocation table, it's a structure, so each element of the table has a structure of, here's the block that, you, that I belong to, and here's where the next allocation table element is located. And then finally, we have the indexed allocation scheme that looks something like this. And this is how Minix 3, EXT4, and a lot of the Unix file systems look. 
in there, we have a bunch of indices that say, here's where you can find the block of file data. And remember, in the indirect zone, this red block is not file data. Instead, it's just a block of pointers, which then point to block data. Remember, all these green are the actual file data. Everything in red and orange are just ways to get to that file data and don't actually pertain to the file itself. If you remember, the disadvantage to this is we have a certain number of pointers. In the Minix 3 file system, we have seven direct, one indirect, one doubly indirect, and one triply indirect. So at a block size of 1,024, that's about 17 gigabytes. If you wanted to address more, you'd have to split that into two inodes, or you can increase the block size to say four kilobytes, and that would give you four times the size. So there you go. That is allocation schemes in a nutshell.